Seeing none, we'll begin then with our opening hymn, hymn 715, Let Me Be Yours Forever. The order of worship we'll be following this morning is entitled Setting One and can be found beginning on page 154 in the French part of your hymnals. Please rise then for the invocation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us then join together and confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. And God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. During the seasons of Advent and Lent, we omit the Gloria, and so we continue then with the service of the Word.
And the Lord be with you. We join together and pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated then for our readings. Our first reading for this Judica Sunday is found in the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, beginning at the first verse. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. We continue then with our psalm of the day, Psalm 22, found in the front part of your hymnal.
Our second lesson is found in the, le in the letter to the Hebrews, the fifth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Our Holy Gospel lesson for this Judica Sunday is found in the Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 20th verse, and we read in Jesus' name, please rise. And hear the words of Christ. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated then for a hymn of the day, hymn 704, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus.
and let us pray. God, grant us the light and strength of your Holy Spirit to believe. Bow our will and thoughts to sincere obedience of faith, so that we may build firm upon the solid rock of our salvation, on your Son's obedience and suffering unto death. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of scripture before us today is found in the letter to the Hebrews, the fifth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe him. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and therefore they are the truth. We pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith through them. Amen. And dear redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, I relish the fact that we have a lectionary, a a set of readings appointed for any given Sunday. Sometimes I wonder why the words chosen were, well, chosen. Take today, for example. You have the portion of scripture before us talking about Jesus Christ and his submission and his obedience. But what is the context of all of this? What is the context of Hebrews chapter 5? Because just cherry picking verses doesn't always give us the best understanding of what God is speaking about. Rather, we need to have the fuller context of a verse to better understand the point that God is making for us. As such, today, the broader context has to do with the priests, and in particular, the high priests, and how they are prone to weakness. The writer to the Hebrews notes that when a priest is chosen by God, the priest is chosen as one who is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. The priests are chosen to perform certain tasks as God has asked them. The priest is not to do his own work. He is not to perform his own tasks, whatever he may deem them to be. Rather, the priest, the pastor, is to share with God's people the source of eternal salvation. Take myself, for example. I have been chosen by God and by you to be your pastor. You all had a call meeting in which you chose me from a list of candidates. And all of the candidates, all of the prospective pastors would have come into this church and proclaimed God's word in its truth and purity. Each of them would have administered the sacraments to you. Each of them would have been a fine teacher to the youth, the middle-aged, and the older alike. Each person on that list would have been a perfectly fine candidate to serve in the pastoral office in Fairfax and Wellington. But here's the secret. That's not really a secret. I'm a sinner. In fact, each and every man on that list is a sinner. Each and every person who functions as a pastor is a sinner. We are not always perfect. We do not always proclaim God's word perfectly. Sometimes we get in the way of God's word. Sometimes we allow what we want or how we think things ought to be done to get in the way of what God wants and what he wants proclaimed. And yet God still works through us. God takes this sinful man and has this man proclaim God's one and only son to a room full of sinners. God uses this man to proclaim salvation to the lost sheep of his fold. God uses this sinner to take the holy and precious word of God to the people who need to hear it the most. But what happens when I make a mistake? What happens when the pastor doesn't live up to the perfect standard set by God? After all, what does God call pastors to do? Well, here's a short list of it. Now, the overseer, the pastor, is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, 
temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Just 17 things in this verse. So what happens when I fail? Because according to this, I fail often. So then what do I as the pastor do? The writer to the Hebrews continues. He, that is the pastor, is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God. So what do I do when I sin? I turn back to God. I ask God to forgive me for what I've done wrong. Because God knew that all of his priests, all of his pastors would sin. They would break his holy and perfect law. And so he made sure to make atonement for all of their sins also. It's not as though the pastor is some spiritual superman. Rather, he is someone chosen by God for a very specific task. Do not misunderstand, the the office of pastor is, is brilliant and spectacular. The man filling the role is a sinner. But he is a sinner chosen by God to proclaim God's word and distribute God's sacraments. But what does that have to do with our text? Well, the writer to the Hebrews explains that Jesus too is a priest, or rather a high priest. And that during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is the one who, to this very day, continues to plead our case before the judgment throne of our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ is our priest. He is the one who offered one sacrifice, one time, for all people. He's not like all the other priests and pastors who must continually come before the throne of God to ask for forgiveness for their sins. Rather, Jesus Christ is the spotless Lamb of God. He is the ultimate sacrifice. He was the one who was offered up for each and every one of us. And Jesus Christ was obedient to death. As Paul tells us that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ took on our flesh, and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Just as the writer to the Hebrews noted, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus Christ learned obedience through what he suffered. Yes, Jesus was obedient to the Father throughout his entire life, but think of what that life entailed. Jesus Christ is God. He is God from all eternity. He is one of the eternal trinity. Yet for a time, he did not always and fully use all of his divine powers. For a time, he suffered through his humiliation. For a time, Jesus, though God, 
did not live as God. He was mocked and he was abused. He suffered want in this earthly life. He was tempted in every way that we are. He was threatened with death. He was chased from place to place. He was ultimately falsely tried and imprisoned. And he was hung on a cross. Jesus Christ, though already perfectly obedient, learned obedience from what he suffered. What he suffered for you. What he suffered on your behalf. For Jesus also learned true obedience as he suffered hell itself on the cross. Jesus Christ had to go to that cross. He had to drink the cup that the Father had given him. And now the perfect Son of Man and Son of God had to suffer hell for you so that he would earn salvation for you. Because Jesus knows your sin. He knows the many sins that you commit every day. And still he chose to be obedient to death, even death on the cross, in order to atone for, to make payment for all of your sins. As the Bishop Locke wrote, for the sake of his perfect suffering and the sacrificial blood he shed, which he now presents to God for our benefit, we are justified and ever receive full forgiveness of sins. And now he calls you to obey him. And quite honestly, we know that we will fail. We know that we will still sin. We know that we will never fully and perfectly obey God's commands. And yet he calls us to obey him. And to obey our Savior, Jesus Christ, is above all to believe in him. Believe in the one who lived the perfect life that you could not. Believe in the one who died on the cross, suffering hell in your place for the many sins that you commit. Believe in the one who rose from the dead and now assures you that you have a place in heaven because of what he has done. Believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And when possible, when it is offered, come to his holy table to receive the forgiveness that he offers to you through his holy meal. Because as your pastor, that is what I am able to offer to you. I can offer you nothing of myself, for of myself I am a sinner. But I offer to you the many treasures and favors of God. I offer you his word and his sacraments. I offer you the means of God's grace, those things that impart God's grace to you, the word in its truth and purity, the holy waters of baptism, and the very body and blood of Christ and his holy communion for the forgiveness of all of your sins. My dear friends, never was disobedience found in him. Yet he learned through his suffering what it meant to be obedient. For you, there is much disobedience found in you. And yet through him, through faith in his life, death, and resurrection, through true and lasting faith in Jesus Christ, you have heaven waiting for you. Because Jesus is the source of eternal salvation, and he offers that salvation to you. And he asks you to believe Believe in the one who is obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And know that through faith in God's one and only Son, you will have heaven when this life is over. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> and now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join together confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue then with the responsive prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit in his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the Word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father. For the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. Please be seated as we pause for our offering. If you have not done so, I invite you to please fill out the friendship registers at this time also. Please rise for prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated then for our closing hymn, hymn 700, Draw Us to Thee. Well, good morning again. And thank you very much for worshiping with us. Carrie Sandgren asked me to hurry up and do church because we have like four pages of announcements to get through. <laughs> um, but let's run through these. So today we do have a service here, service out at Emmanuel. Um, we actually do not have youth group tonight. Why don't we have youth group tonight, Ms. Bunkers? Mrs. Bunkers, sorry. Because the there are basketball games tonight. Parents are gonna dominate the youth. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Cade. <laughs> Dominate. Okay. Um, so yes, those games start at, I think it's five, if I remember, yep, five, okay. Um, and it's B girls, A girls, B boy, B, B, A, A. Okay, so yeah. So if you wanna come catch those games, they're always a hoot. Um, yeah, and we're gonna teach the A boys a lesson. Uh, tomorrow, we do have Jesus Cares at 6.30. Tuesday, we do have five o'clock parade grazing. Wednesday, we do have our Lent service here at St. John. Um, and beforehand at, are you sure, 5.30, six? 5.30 is more of a sit down, chicken, potatoes, dessert kind of meal. The men are hosting, way to go men. Um, so that'll be happening in the all-purpose room this Wednesday, 5.30. Thursday, we have our final big class for this session, and then next week, we have all of our regular stuff. We do have the Stronger Together Cancer Support Group. There is the LWS door collection back there. Char is back there already waiting. Um, we put what the, what the funds go towards. 
it, it's kind of the summer student assistance and then also the world missions projects. Easter plants can still be ordered for another week. That's back there. Organ recital on the 23rd, MLC event, Lent Vespers on March 24th at 7.30. Bloodmobile will be here on the 26th. PLS story time, see what I mean. Um, and then two that I was asked to make that are not in here. You can check the rest of those out. Um, first and foremost, from 11 to 1 today, there is a barbecue fundraiser out at Zion and Winthrop for God's, is it God's little treasures or God's treasures? God's treasures. I always forget that, sorry. But from 11 to 1, and all proceeds go towards that, their expansion that they're doing and everything else like that. So if you'd like to support that, um, they are having that fundraiser out at Zion Winthrop today. And then also today, the Treasure House is having its annual meeting at 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall of St. Paul's Church in New Ulm. Those two didn't make it, so I wanted to make sure I got to those. Any other announcements? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the Southwest Area Chorale, Lutheran Chorale, is having their uh, concerts today. One's in Woodlake. I think the other one is in Hutch, and they might be two and seven or something like that. Anybody part of it that knows for sure? Two and seven. Two and seven. There it is. The Grunkies have spoken. Okay. Any other announcements that I don't know about? So I got done fast. <laughs> Seeing none, I pray then that the Lord is with you today and always.